Okay, and when you approach this topic, please remember, take a look at the learning objectives so you don't study more or less. Okay, the significance of immunity, that's something that is not hard to know, okay? That's the function or the importance that it has for our body, defending the body. Then we are gonna be seeing the classification of the immune responses. We have the innate immunity. So it's important to understand the different roles of the innate, okay, uh, immunity, and also the adaptive or acquired immunity. Okay, in this uh, second branch, the adaptive specific immunity, it's important to differentiate the roles of the humoral and cellular arms, okay, the mediators, the different cells and antibodies, the functions of these cells and antibodies. And also we are gonna be talking about how the cells in the immune system talk to each other and what is the molecular basis for this uh, communication between cells and also how the cells, how the immune system cells recognize different antigens, different things that may uh, elicit the immune response. So we are gonna be talking about regulation, which is the main topic of physiology of the uh, immune responses. Okay, we are gonna be talking about the regulation of the production of antibodies, cytokines, chemokines, and also the complement system what is the role that the complement system has in producing like a link between the innate and adaptive immune responses. And also we are gonna be seeing the role of the cells, okay, granulocytes, different cells, mast cells, monocytes, platelets, in, for example, recognizing and also killing the bacteria. Okay, and also inflammation, Okay, what is the basis of the inflammatory responses and wound healing and the different types of responses, primary, secondary immune responses and different responses against different types of pathogens. So immunity is a vast topic and I think that if you start learning about immunity and you get to like it, you're going to have a great future in the field of medicine. Okay, nowadays immunity or immunology is developing every time more. And probably part of the future of medicine is gonna be immunology related. Okay, there is a field of medicine that is on, on development. That is a, a field that studies how we can personalize medicine. Okay, we have medications that we give to many patients that have the same diseases but some of them respond, some of them don't respond very well. And this is probably because there is something that is specific to different people that determines why some people have better responses to certain medications. And the basis for that is probably genetic and immunologic. So giving a more personalized, customized treatment to patients is probably okay, part of the future of medicine. Immunology uh, comes, or the word immunity comes from a Latin word that is immunitas. Okay, this word was used for a, in reference to people who were free from civil obligations, so they didn't pay taxes. Okay, I don't know if there is someone right now that doesn't pay taxes, probably some organizations. But medically speaking, uh, this term refers to someone who is protected from infections, okay? Either because they are born with certain factors that protect them or because they acquire certain factors, okay? Either artificially or naturally, okay? Immune system is comprised of uh, two types of immune responses, basically. One that we are born with, different uh, structures and mechanisms that protect us from infection from the very moment when we are born. Okay, and also we acquire some other type of responses. That means the immune system learns how to respond. Okay, the immune system, um, sometimes we believe that if we, for example, have kids away from pathogens, we are doing a great favor, but the immune system 
is like a soldier, okay? A soldier doesn't learn how to uh, fight in a war just by being in a, for example, just by having good nutrition and exercise, they need to get trained in how to use the weapons. They need to have a, a different type of simulation exercises in order to learn how to respond to the real enemy. Okay, the same thing happens with the immune system. Okay, if we have a person isolated in a sterile environment that is never exposed to antigens or to bacteria, to infections, or at least to vaccines, the immune system will, will never learn. Okay, and that is not a good thing. So that's what the adaptive immune response does. Okay, it receives um, antigens, bacteria, infections, or different types of proteins that we may give to people when we administer a vaccine, and it learns how to fight these different types of uh, foreign things or threatens that enter into our body. Both responses, the innate and the adaptive immunity, okay, are performed by cells and proteins. And there is a very complex network of signaling and cell-to-cell -cell communication that we are gonna try to understand today. Okay, this branch, the innate immunity, depends on our genetics and also physiologic factors. And the main role of this innate response is to reduce the workload for the adaptive response that is more complex. Okay, this could be compared to, for example, the role of the police and the FBI. Okay, every time there is something wrong, we don't call the FBI, okay, to take care of this. The police is the one that is normally patrolling, monitoring, uh, making sure that everything's fine, that everything, nothing goes out of normal. But if there is something very specific that needs to be taken care of, something that is a very special threat, then in that case, or very specific crime, in that case, we call the FBI or any other special forces to take care of that. Now, the innate response is more or less always the same. If there is an infection, the response is gonna be more or less the same, try to kill the pathogen, produce some inflammatory response that can be localized or can spread to the whole body, okay? The, innate response is limited simply to identify that there is a threat and try to destroy it, try to clear it, or at least isolate it. And then if necessary, mobilize the adaptive response. Okay, imagine the police discovers that there is something, a group of people that is doing something wrong in some place, they try to go there, but imagine they see that uh, these people have uh, connections with some a, let's say foreign government or something. Oh my goodness, this is not something for the police. Let's call the FBI, let's call the CIA. And maybe we don't intervene now and we give time for special forces to act. Okay, the innate response, innate immunity is composed of barriers like the skin, mucous membranes, secretions, sweat, saliva, gastric acid. Okay, these secretions have antimicrobial substances, they have different characteristics like the pH that are a, a good barrier against pathogens. Okay, so they are very good to maintain pathogens away from the body. And not only pathogens, also the cells of our microbiome. Okay, the response by the immune system may be, as I said before, localized. Okay, simply imagine we have a mosquito bite and there is a bacteria that enters so we're gonna maybe have a little inflammatory response that may be manifested with, with a little amount of pus there. But if the bacteria escape from there, then we are gonna have systemic inflammation, systemic uh, manifestations of this invasion that will be manifested as fever, as some symptoms that we may feel like fatigue, malaise, anorexia, et cetera. Okay, that's something that we call the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So to try to summarize this first part, the immune system main function is to protect the organism by simply distinguishing what is self from non-self. Okay, and depending on the threat, it's gonna activate some responses. Some of them are antigen specific, 
and some of them are non-specific. And the responses may be different depending on if the threat is a, an extracellular organism like a bacteria or a, an intracellular organism like viruses or different toxins or cancer cells, or simply if the response is to remove dead cells of our, our own tissues. Okay, we are going to try to understand how it works by starting uh, first seeing the different components of the immune system. Okay, here we have the innate defenses and the adaptive defenses, the more specific ones. Okay, we have the barriers, uh, skin, mucous membranes. We have the mucociliary clearance, very important in the respiratory system. Cilia and the mucus that removes every debris. Every time we breathe, we, uh, a, a, a lot of particles enter in the lungs, dust or different particles. And these have to be moved away. There is a the cilia of the bronchi move all of these secretions upwards, okay, and then they enter into the pharynx and we swallow these secretions and any debris, any bacteria that might be present there or a virus would be normally destroyed in the stomach. Then we have the phagocytic cells, the dendritic cells, and the natural killer cells, which are lymphocytes that participate in this innate response. And many other cells and proteins that we are gonna be seeing. And we are gonna see the complement system, how it links the innate with the adaptive response and how it can be activated by either uh, the bacteria or by antibodies. So it responds or may be activated by the innate immune responses and also by the adaptive immune responses. We are gonna see uh, the role of dendritic cells and macrophages, how they can activate the specific defenses. Okay, these cells, when they detect a pathogen, they, are, they belong to the innate responses, but they may travel okay, to the lymph nodes and wake up the lymphocytes. Okay, so producing a link as well as the complement uh, between the innate and adaptive immune responses. And the natural killer cells, which are very important cells okay, that perform innate immunity systems uh, functions, but we are gonna be seeing more in detail later. And the adaptive defenses, we have two branches. Okay, one is antibody mediated and the other is cell mediated. Okay, these are called adaptive or specific defenses because they provide specificity and memory Okay, we are not born with them. Okay, and they respond only to pathogens, okay, specific pathogens. That means if, for example, there is a lymphocyte that was activated during, um, let's say, a flu infection, these antibodies or the memory cells of these lymphocytes are going to be produced or reactivated only when there is another flu infection, not against any other type of infection. Antibodies normally work for or against extracellular pathogens, bacteria, for example, or any protein that may be in the extracellular fluid like toxins. Okay, the cells, the cell mediated immunity normally works against intracellular pathogens, okay, like viruses, parasites, some bacteria, okay, or for example, they respond to foreign cells in the case of a transplant, or cells of our body that have become abnormal, like cancers. So we're gonna see the role of the lymphocytes in fighting, fighting cancer. Then we have the different components of the first, second line of defense. Okay, these are the two lines that belong to the innate immunity. Okay, the external defenses are the first line. We have there the skin, mucous membranes, which are a physical barrier. They secrete sweat, mucus, saliva, and different other secretions that have a specific pH that a bacteria normally don't stand. 
Okay, these secretions contain enzymes that destroy, destroy bacteria, contain antibodies. Okay, the saliva, for example, contains antibodies. Okay, the acidity of the stomach destroys any bacteria that enters there and some viruses. The digestive enzymes and the normal flora in the digestive tract also help us fight in infections. In the respiratory tract, we mentioned before the movement of mucus by the cilia. Okay, there we have also macrophages. And the mucus, the mucus contains mucin, which is a protein that has antibacterial properties. And we have also antibodies like in any secretion. And in the genitourinary tract, we have different um, defenses. For example, just the flushing action of the urine, the acidity of the urine, the pH of the vagina that contains lactic acid and the normal flora, okay, uh, exactly as in the skin or in the GI tract. Now, the second line of defenses of defense uh, or, this, uh, or the internal defenses, there we have the phagocytic cells, macrophages, neutrophils that destroy bacteria or cellular debris. Okay, the interferons, we are going to see the role of the interferons later in fighting viral infections. The complement that we are going to see in detail, participate in recognition and destruction of bacteria and amplifying the inflammatory response. And we are going to talk also about fever. Okay, fever is a mechanism that is produced by pyrogens. Okay, we are going to see how it works endogenous pyrogens that are secreted by leukocytes okay help to mount this fever response that you are going to see how important it is for the defense of the body so let's go into the cells okay of the innate response we have the macrophages dendritic cells natural killer cells mast cells and some others okay the macrophages are uh, special cells that are made or originate from the monocytes. They are recruited to the places of infection and they have different roles like processing antigens and secretion of mediators, inflammatory mediators that link the innate response to the specific immune responses. Okay, normally macrophages may be present in the tissues. They are called resident macrophages or maybe recruited as monocytes that then become macrophages. Okay, when they are activated, they produce some cytokines. Okay, examples of cytokines are tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, all of these interleukins that nowadays uh, many people talk about. Okay, uh, cytokines uh, was a word that some time ago, a year ago, most people didn't know what they were. And nowadays, many people that don't have any relationship with medicine, they talk, okay, because of the COVID pandemic and this famous cytokine storm that many people are familiar with. Now, these uh, macrophages may be activated by different uh, microbes or antibodies or the complement. And the most important role they have is phagocytosis. And they also present anti antigens to other cells like lymphocytes. The same antigen presentation okay, that macrophages have is also a, a characteristic of the dendritic cells, okay, also known as Langerhans cells on the skin. Okay, they process antigens like the macrophages. They transport the antigens from different places, skin, or mucous membranes, GI tract to the lymph nodes or lymphoid tissues. And there they present the antigens to the T cells. And that's the way they link the innate response with the adaptive immune response. The natural killer cells, as the name says, they are professional killers, okay, but belong to the innate response, not to the adaptive, like other lymphocytes. Okay, they are in charge of responding quickly to any infection that is located inside the cell. For example, vi viral infections, they destroy viral 
uh, viral infected cells, and also they help in controlling early signs of cancer. Okay, when they say one cell in a tissue becomes a cancer, if it has some characteristics, natural killer cells are gonna destroy them. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why people don't develop cancers until late in life, with some exceptions. Now, the next cells are the mast cells, very important in the allergic response by releasing histamine. We have also the neutrophils, which are the first responders. Okay, every time there is an infection, the first cells that go there okay, are the neutrophils. They are very important phagocytic cells. Okay, migrate from the blood vessels into the tissues. And normally when they get there, they release toxins to kill bacteria, to kill any fungi or any other infection, and they recruit other cells to the site of infection. Okay, when they, these cells get there and destroy whatever is present in the tissue, they are gonna die and they are gonna form a yellowish secretion that is what we call pus. And the other two cells are the basophils and the eosinophils. Basophils are important in the defenses against parasites. They also release histamine and participate in allergic reactions. And the eosinophils release toxins to destroy bacteria and parasites. Okay, when they are present in the tissues in great amounts, they may release toxins okay, that may cause tissue damage as well. So it's important for our body to regulate this very well so we don't have a, a, an excessive amount of these cells, okay? Because if they are in excess and they work in excess, they might, okay, besides destroying bacteria or pathogens, they might produce damage to our tissues. Now, here you have an illustration of the cells. This is a beautiful electronic micrograph, okay, of the blood cells. Okay, you have their monocytes with the number one. You have lymphocytes with the number two, neutrophils with the number three, and then red blood cells, the more abundant cells, platelets with the number five down here. Okay, leukocytes are very similar to each other. Okay, they are distinguished simply by sometimes the size, sometimes the shape of the nucleus. Okay, and other characteristics, how they uh, are stained, what is their color. That's why we have some basophils that are stained blue, eosinophils that are stained more pink, and we have the granulocytes that have granules inside. For example, the neutrophils are granulocytes, but the monocytes and lymphocytes don't have any granules, so they are called agranulocytes. So let's take a look at how, when there is an infection, this immune response is activated. Okay, how we activate the immune response. And I recommend you to, when you study this, try to make associations with different things that may happen in real life. Okay, this is exactly us asking ourselves how the defenses of a country are activated if there is an invasion, okay? If there is, let's say, uh, some foreign army that is trying to enter through any uh, of our states, okay, how the army is activated, how the defenses of the country are activated, different sections of the army, okay? There has to be a monitoring system there has to be a communication system. There has to be, of course, a commander in chief. There has to be a very good organization okay, of this hierarchy and the ways of communication. Okay, the first thing that has to occur is the detection of the pathogens or the tissue damage. Okay, and know that infections may be intracellular or extracellular. Okay, you may have enemies outside, for example, buildings and enemies inside some buildings. So you have to find a way of fighting these different types of enemies if they are on the street or, or they are inside a building. 
Okay, for example, viruses are the most common intracellular parasites. Bacteria, most of them are extracellular, but some of them may be intracellular, exactly as parasites. Parasites, well, depending on the size, okay, you know, we have uh, macroscopic parasites, that may be in the intestine or they may circulate in the blood depending on the life cycle, okay, of the parasite. Okay, when they are in the microscopic stages of the life cycle, they may be in the liver, they may be in the muscles, they may be in different organs. So depending on the life cycle of the parasite, we are going to activate different types of responses. Now, what is the mechanism? Okay, if the pathogen is on, this, on, the, on the skin, well, you have some mechanisms there so it doesn't go in. But once the pathogen enters, and gets in contact with the connective tissues, okay, we are gonna start detecting them by the interaction between different molecules. Okay, for example, pathogens normally have some molecules that are foreign to our body. And we call these molecules pathogen associated molecular patterns, maybe lipopolysaccharides, maybe peptidoglycan or, or other components. Okay, that are present on the pathogen surface. Now, if there is tissue damage, our cells become damaged, there are other molecules that are gonna be exposed. And we call these damage associated molecular patterns, which are called damps. Okay, so either pumps or damps are gonna be recognized by dendritic cells or macrophages because they have receptors on the cell membrane that are called pattern recognition receptors or PRRs. One example is the toll-like receptor that is present on these cells that recognizes these abnormal molecules. Okay, the word toll-like has nothing to do with the tolls that we pay, but I think that they work in the same way. It's like when you are scanning a barcode or when your car passes below the, the toll and scan, okay, these are receptors that recognize specific pattern. Okay, what are examples of pathogen associated molecular patterns? The lipopolysaccharide that is present on the membrane of the gram negative bacteria, the peptidoglycan that is a component of the gram positive bacteria, double stranded RNA that is a characteristic of some viruses and some other proteins that we normally don't have. Once the interaction between the receptors and the abnormal mo molecules occurs, then these cells are gonna release certain cytokines that will activate different other cells of the adaptive immune system, for example, B cells and T cells, which belong to the third line of defense, specific adaptive immunity. At the same time, the complement system is going to be activated and certain molecules are going to be released that are going to attract other inflammatory cells like neutrophils, monocytes. So this complement system is going to activate or is going to amplify the immune response so we are able to neutralize and if possible, destroy the pathogen that is inside our body now. We are gonna be seeing later the functions of the protein, of the complement proteins. Generally speaking, or the broad function is phagocytosis, lysis or destruction of the targeted cells and also amplify the inflammatory response. So let's take a look at some specific aspects, okay? Let's take a look at cytokines, okay? what? Do we need to know, know about cytokines? There are many, okay? We are not gonna study all of them because that would take several days, okay? Simply try to understand the general function they have, okay? As I told you before, the binding of these abnormal molecular patterns with the receptors on our cells triggers the release of cytokines, which are chemical messengers that signal that something is wrong. Okay, these cytokines will regulate the cell differentiation. Okay, for example, will stimulate other cells to divide. 
okay, to change their function or to become activated, regulate the proliferation, production of more cells, will regulate the gene expression to determine what type of immune response we need to produce. Okay, if there is a viral infection, if there is a bacterial infection or a parasitic or a fungal infection, our immune system cells are gonna release different type of cytokines telling the immune system and telling our body what type of pathogen we are dealing with. So what type of response we need to elicit. Okay, this will signal the nervous system. Okay, so we feel certain symptoms that everyone is very familiar with, like fatigue, anorexia, lethargy, muscle pain, and nausea. Okay, so we take a rest and we don't do abnormal things and we don't use energy in doing things that we normally do because we need that energy and to produce okay antibodies and to produce a very effective immune response okay another thing that happens is fever that we are going to be uh, talking about in a in a little bit examples of cytokines are the interferons okay excellent proteins that help us control viral infections okay and the interleukins that are produced by the leukocytes intercommunication between leukocytes Okay, these are like the uh, signals that help leukocytes to talk to, to each other and produce a bridge between the innate and adaptive responses and also lets other cells know what the other cell is doing and also to control that the immune response doesn't go beyond what is healthy for the body. We have here a diagram that represents the function of interference. Okay, we have here a cell on the left that is infected by a virus. This may be one of the cells in our nasopharynx. The virus has infected it, so that cell is lost, totally lost. The cell starts producing interference. Notice how the interference make contact with neighboring cells, and this signals the production of proteins inside other cells okay that will protect these other cells from infection okay so viruses may enter but they will not divide inside the cells interference besides protecting neighboring cells also activate other immune cells so they are aware that there is a viral infection and they know what to do interference are great for this but they make us feel horrible Okay, when we have a viral infection and that bad feeling, that tiredness that we have, that is because of the release of interference into the blood. Okay, so it's, uh, it's responsible for part of the symptoms that we feel when we have any kind of viral infection. Next, I wanted to talk about phagocytosis. Okay, which is the main function of some of the cells of the innate response. For example, the neutrophils, okay, first responders, and of other cells that belong to the mononuclear phagocyte system, that is monocytes and macrophages. Okay, we already mentioned what is the role of the neutrophils, okay, the first ones that go to the places of infection and die. And then we have the monocytes and macrophages, which live a lot longer than these neutrophils. Okay, we have different types of macrophages. Some of them are called resident macrophages, and some of them are recruited as monocytes from the blood. Okay, normally the macrophages, the ones that I mentioned before that are called resident macrophages resident when they are present in the connective tissue they are called histiocytes cells of the tissues okay these are very important in any connective tissue like the dermis for example but they are also very important in the spleen lymph nodes and bone marrow 
And we have some specific resident macrophages that receive different names when they are located in specific organs. For example, if they are in the liver, they are gonna be called Kupfer cells. When they are present in the alveoli, in the lungs, they are called alveolar macrophages, and those in the brain are called microglia. Okay, I forgot to mention here a specific type of a macrophage that is present in the bone tissue, and that is one that we call osteoclast. Okay, the one that reabsorbs bone, calcium, okay, destroys bone when we need to increase the calcium in the circulation. So phagocytosis is a very important process that normally occurs it's the first thing that we try to do when there is an infection. Here we have a place where there might be an infection. Okay, notice that this picture, okay, represents an area that is attracting neutrophils. Okay, what do we have here? What is what the author of this picture calls chemotaxis source? It's an area where we have the presence of a chemotactic substance. Chemotactic means chemical attracting substance. This may, or this chemotactic source, may be bacteria, may be viruses, may be dead tissue, may be a foreign protein that was injected or entered there, a toxin, for example, maybe necrotic tissue, maybe dead blood cells, Anything abnormal will attract macrophage, uh, neutrophils first and then monocytes. Okay, and here we have represented how neutrophils are attracted to a site of infection. Okay, they first go from circulating in the center of the blood vessel to the periphery of the blood vessels by a process known as margination and then they move in between the epithelial cells by a process known as diapedesis. And then they perform some amoeboid movements until they reach the area of higher concentration of the chemotactic substance. Okay, now this increased permeability is something that occurs as a result of the cytokine release. For example, when there is an infection, when there is a tissue injury, okay, we normally have here some cells like mast cells that will release histamine and this histamine will produce vasodilation and will increase the opening or the separation between the epithelial cells or endothelial cells in this case, allowing that cells, plasma and proteins like antibodies go from the blood into the place of infection. Okay, this plasma is going to produce tissue edema, swelling. Okay, this vasodilation is what will produce the redness that we associate with inflammation. And the migration of neutrophils is going to initiate the phagocytosis, and then it's going to lead to the production of pus in this infected area. In a second step, step monocytes are going to be recruited. They are gonna do the same, and they are gonna become macrophages that are gonna help, okay, with the destruction of pathogens and the regulation of the inflammatory response. And then the macrophages are gonna clean up everything, making sure that, okay, everything stays as it was before the infection. Of course, that not all, always works perfectly, and sometimes we may have complications of this uh, inflammatory response or in the repair process. And here we have represented the phagocytosis process. Okay, we have here a microbe. Notice how the microbe has these red dots, which are different proteins present there. Those are the antigens that the microbes have. In this case, we have some antibodies that are bound to these antigens. 
Okay, once a microbe is surrounded by antibodies, it becomes a target for destruction. They are easily recognized by phagocytic cells. And these microbes and the antibodies are going to be internalized. Okay, for, and this internalization is going to produce a vesicle. Okay, and this process is simply an endocytosis that is mediated by receptors. Okay, the vesicle that is formed after this endocytosis is going to be, is known as a phagosome. Okay, some is simply this suffix comes from the word soma, which is body. So this is like a body, like a vacuole that contains the substance that, substance that was phagocytosed that's why it's called a phagosome. Inside the cells, we have other vesicles. In this case, it's an organelle that we call the lysosome that contains digestive enzymes. Okay, so the next step is to produce the fusion of the phagosome with the lysosome, forming a phagolysosome. And this will allow the contact between the digestive enzymes of the lysosome and the pathogen. Okay, here we have represented the destruction and digestion of the microbe and the release of microbial debris. Okay, by this phagocytic cell. Now, something that is not represented here is a, a process that is called antigen presentation. Okay, let's say this is a, a neutrophil. If this is a neutrophil, this is simply what is going to happen. But if this is a macrophage, we are going to have another step, and it's the presentation of the pathogen. Okay, part of this bacteria, more exactly the antigens, are going to be taken out of the cells and are going to be presented. This macrophage is going to present, it's going to show to other cells what it has inside. Okay, I just ate and destroyed a bacteria that has this antigen. Okay, and this antigen may be seen and recognized by cells of the adaptive response, by T cells, for example, or by B cells. And that's the way macrophages, okay, represent a link between the innate response and the adaptive response. So in this slide, we have like a representation, okay, of several of the factors that participate in the local inflammatory response. Okay, we have a representation of a bacteria that is entering in the connective tissues of the body. Okay, we have, this is representing the case that we already have antibodies against this bacteria. Okay, so the B lymphocytes produce antibodies that will surround the bacteria and it's gonna be phagocytosed by the process that we saw before. Okay, and also, we have a representation of the role of the mast cells. Okay, once the phagocytosis occurs, okay, we are going to have different processes. One of them is the activation of the complement. The complement is activated by uh, the presence in the tissues of antibodies bound to the antigen, something that we call antigen antibody complexes. Okay, when the complement is activated, this will produce the release of some proteins that will activate the mast cells. Okay, the mast cells are going to produce cytokines, for example, histamine. Histamine, as I told you before, will dilate the blood vessels. It's a very powerful vasodilator. Will separate the endothelial cells, increasing the capillary permeability that will allow that plasma, proteins, and also cells 
move from the blood into the tissues that are infected. Okay, so we, when we study the immune response, the inflammatory response, it is important to have into consideration not only the specific isolated facts, also how all of these things work together and in coordination. Okay, so let's uh, stop here for a while. Let's have a little break, okay, for 10 minutes. And before going to the break, let me ask you if you have any question of the things we have been talking up to this moment. Adriano, I have a clarification question. Yes, yes, uh, sure. So on the slide that we just finished, the mm -hmm. um, activation of the complement that has the release of histamine and um, increases capillary permeability is technically a negative thing in our immune response, right? Because that would allow the infection to become systemic. Uh, the activation of the complement is normally a part of the normal inflammatory response. However, in some cases, the excessive activation of the complement may lead to tissue destruction. For example, when these antibodies are bound to our own cells, okay, will destroy our tissues, or when we have the release of certain proteins that we call anaphylac uh, anaphylotoxins that may lead to an anaphylactic reaction okay but if all of this is perfectly regulated okay nothing negative has to happen because at the same time that this is happening and we are releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines we have cells that are releasing anti-inflammatory cytokines that will stop the inflammatory process and keep it under control and localized if possible okay but in some cases we can have excessive or abnormal activation of the complement and damage to our cells in that case it's going to be a negative thing okay okay thank you you're welcome okay it's 10 55 and let's have a break for 10 minutes okay see you. When we study the immune response, uh, one very important thing to remember always is the order okay, in which the cells appear. Okay, and this is going to be very important in the future when you study the inflammatory response in pathophysiology and to understand the differences between the acute and the chronic inflammatory response. Okay, I mentioned before that the neutrophils are the first responders. They go in huge numbers to the place of infection immediately to try to destroy and neutralize the pathogens that may be present. Okay, so you have here how immediately after the infection, we have a huge increase in neutrophils. Of course, this will depend on the type of pathogen okay it's not the same response when we have a bacterial or a viral infection here we are representing a bacterial infection in the case of viral infections this is not going to occur because remember viruses normally infect cells and they are going to be located inside the cells so neutrophils have nothing to do there okay we have other specific other responses for that Okay, but in the case of a bacterial infection, neutrophils are going to increase in the first days after the infection. And then we have the process of uh, recruiting some monocytes. So they increase slowly, okay, until they become the predominant cell present at the uh, site of inflammation after 10 to 12 days. Okay, and normally we should clear the infection at this point. Okay, we should clear it. And in that case, the monocytes are gonna go down. And then the more important cells are gonna be the lymphocytes. Okay, because the lymphocytes are the ones that are gonna retain the memory, okay, of that event and are gonna act if the infection occurs again. Okay, but if we don't clear the infection, then this is gonna be a bit different. Okay, this is going to uh, be 
something like this, we are going to have the permanence of monocytes and lymphocytes for a very long time. And that is what we call a chronic infection. Okay. But normally, this is what happens. And let's, say, let, let's see another of the factors that helps in the inflammatory response, but more at the systemic level. Let's take a look at fever, which is a very important mechanism of defense. Remember, the body temperature is regulated by the hypothalamus. We have there the thermoregulatory center that generally is establishing a temperature set point of about 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, this thermostat will respond to the presence of pyrogens. Pyrogens may be different substances that may be uh, produced by the bacteria or different toxins. We call those external uh, pyrogens, but also we have some endogenous pyrogens, which are cytokines that our inflammatory cells produce. Okay, once the macrophages get in contact or are activated by different uh, antigens, they are going to release cytokines, for example, in response to endotoxins, like lipopolysaccharides. Okay, these cytokines are, the most common examples are interleukin-1 and 6, and also tumor necrosis factor. They are going to promote the fever response and also make us feel sleepy and also activate some cells in the liver okay, to produce other cytokines that will lead to a reduction in the amount of iron in the blood. Okay, because iron is a very important mineral for bacterial metabolism. So our body makes sure that bacteria don't have iron available okay, for survival. Okay, these cytokines, besides producing fever, are going to increase the activity of other inflammatory cells and are going to increase the production of interferons. Okay, that is very important in fighting viruses, for example. Here we have a representation of that. There is a viral infection. Okay, we have a normal temperature of 37 degrees. We have macrophages um, in contact with the bacteria. Okay, we have other uh, factors like tissue necrosis that is detected by other inflammatory cells. The production of tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 signals the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases certain chemicals like norepinephrine that activates chemicals like arachidonic acid. And this arachidonic acid is going to be converted into prostaglandins. PGE2, for example, is one of the prostaglandins glandins that we produce and these prostaglandins are the ones that produce the effects that lead to fever okay for example muscle chivering and etc vasodilation muscle chivering okay that we are going to see in the next part and that will lead to the increase in the temperature of the body okay after the hypothalamus increases the set point of the body temperature Okay, this is talking, or this one to the right, okay, shows the hypothalamus, the central thermoreceptors, okay, how it produces different effects in different uh, organs of the body, okay, for example, produces vasodilation, okay, produces sweating, produces muscle chivering, and all of this is going to lead to radiation or heat dissipation by radiation, convection, evaporation, etc., okay, different mechanisms that participate in increasing the body temperature okay also making sure that we have an increase um, um, metabolic rate okay that helps in the immune response some other sources say, say that increasing the body temperature is also negative for bacteria but simply uh, the most important thing is that this increase in temperature also helps the body to retain iron and to increase the metabolic rate so we favor okay the defenses of the body that they can do their proper job interferons we mentioned this before alert cells neighboring cells when there is a viral infection 
Okay, the viruses may invade the cells, but they won't replicate or assemble new viral particles. Okay, notice how interferons stimulate other cells like macrophages. Okay, so they become better at phagocytosis. They activate, uh, for example, lymphocytes, okay, cytotoxic cells and the natural killer cells and the production of antibodies by the B cells. And interferons also participate in inhibiting cell division and tumor growth. So these are important chemicals when there are early cancer cells or early stages of cancer, okay, in preventing that these cancer cells divide and spread. Okay, interferons also inhibit the maturation of the adipose cells and the maturation of erythrocytes. So before uh, moving to the adaptive response, okay, it's important to always, uh, when you get to this point in your study, okay, try to make it by having okay, a diagram that shows how all of these cells and cytokines interact with each other. Try to see the big picture. Okay, these are not two different things. These are, or this, all of this is a, very well coordinated response okay so we don't have like two different immune systems we divide the immune response into different sections in order to organize our study and in order to understand this better but it's important to see how all of this works as a single immune response okay the adaptive defenses the specific defenses are going to be recruited only if it's necessary but always every time we have an encounter with an antigen the adaptive defenses the lymphocytes are going to be alerted so they prepare to mount an immune response if necessary okay for example if we receive a vaccine maybe we don't feel any symptom maybe we don't develop any bad thing but we are gonna have okay t cells and b cells that are going to be ready to produce a very good a very effective response if we get in contact with the same antigen or with the real thing the adaptive defenses provide us with specific immunity okay the t cells and the b cells are the main actors here okay they are made in the bone marrow both but the T cells mature, they learn how to fight in the thymus. Okay, they are made both okay in the bone marrow. Okay, but some of these cells travel to the thymus to learn how to fight. The others, the B cells, okay, they are gonna mature in the bone marrow okay or and are gonna work in the lymph nodes okay exactly as the t-cells let's take a look at the classification of the lymphoid organs okay the lymphoid organs are divided into primary and secondary okay in order to not forget this okay i always like to compare or to say that the primary lymphoid organs are like the school and the secondary are like the job, where they work, okay? The primary lymphoid organs are the thymus and the bone marrow, okay? That teach the T cells and the B cells what they have to do in the future. Now, once they learn, and if they learn well, after they graduate, they both travel to the secondary lymphoid organs, which are the spleen, okay, the lymph nodes, and the tonsils and other types of lymphoid tissue. The T cells are called thymus dependent cells. Okay, they represent up to 85% of the lymphocytes in the blood, lymph nodes, okay, and spleen. And they provide us with the cell mediated immunity. Okay, cell mediated immunity because a cell 
say a T cell, in order to perform its action, needs to get in contact directly with another cell. Say this cell is infected by a virus or has become a cancer cell. Well, the T cell has to go there and directly destroy the other one. Okay, the B cells are different. Okay, they are called thymus independent and they originated in the bone marrow and learn in the bone marrow. Okay, they provide us with humoral immunity. They are the ones that become plasma cells when they are activated and produce an antibody mediated immunity ex tar targeting extracellular pathogens. Okay, if pathogens are in the blood or in the extracellular fluids, okay, you are not going to send a cell there to get all of them. That would be very difficult. So what B cells do is they produce antibodies that will neutralize all of these, path all of these toxins or uh, abnormal things, viruses or bacteria in the extracellular fluids. Here we have a diagram that shows what I was trying to explain. This is bone, there you have the bone marrow. Okay, you have here the hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, that produces some cells that are gonna travel to the thymus and become T cells. Other cells are gonna develop into B cells and are gonna travel to lymph nodes or lymphoid tissues. The T cells are gonna perform the cell mediated immunity, the B cells, the humoral one. And notice how they need to work in a way that is coordinated. Okay, the T cell has to talk to the B cell so it makes antibodies. The B cell will talk to the T cell so it makes sure that the antibodies that it's making are the proper ones. Okay, notice also that the B cell needs to become a plasma cell before making antibodies. And what is the difference between a B cell and a plasma cell? Notice the size and the presence of this rough endoplasmic reticulum, huge, because it has to make tons of proteins. Okay, a plasma cell makes around 2,000 antibodies per second. So imagine what a rough endoplasmic reticulum it needs to make that amount of proteins. And all of this is uh, under the control of different cytokines that they are producing, okay? That they know what to do. They work in harmony, okay? And they do what they have to do and not too much, okay? No, they don't go beyond what they should be doing. So then we have another extremely important thing, okay, besides, I told you before the order of the cells is important, neutrophils, monocytes, and then lymphocytes. But also the difference between the primary and the secondary immune response is essential. Okay, and here we have a representation of, imagine we are doing an experiment and we inject an antigen in a person, this may be a vaccine. Mind someone receives the COVID vaccine. Okay, but this also could be a person that is infected by a bacteria or a virus. Okay, we have here the amount of antibodies in the blood, something that we call the titer of antibodies. For example, when you move to the clinical rotations, Okay, in some places they are gonna ask you for a test that shows that you have a good titer of antibodies against hepatitis, etc. Okay, when we have a first contact with the ant with an antigen, okay, we are gonna have some days in which we don't have any antibodies in the blood. Why? Because let's say the antigen enters into our body, it has to be detected by the dendritic cells. Then the dendritic cells need to travel to the lymph node and show the antigen to the T cells. Then the T cell has to talk to the B cell. The B cell has to develop and become a plasma cell and then has to start making antibodies. All of this is a very long process. Okay, because this is a customized work. 
It's like if you hire someone to make a, you know, to repair or to replace a door or a window at home. And oh my goodness, this is a, this is, these are not a conventional uh, measures. We need to make a customized door. It will, will take two months. Okay. If it were, if there were conventional doors, I would go to Home Depot and buy one it's tomorrow, but I have to make the door two months. It's going to take me. The same thing happens when we have an encounter for the first time with an antigen. It takes a while to develop the customized specific response. So you don't detect antibodies until after 14 days, two weeks. Okay. And we develop a very little amount of antibodies. And these are going to be, as we are going to see later, of the type IgM. Because our body makes the response, but it doesn't want to create too many because the body is not sure. Okay, is this something that is just randomly? Is this something that we encounter just by chance and maybe we never encounter again? Is this under control? Well, I don't need to make any more antibodies. But if we have an encounter with the same antigen again, Okay, there says 60 days, but this could be five years later or 10 years later. Okay, when we have the second encounter with the same antigen, now all of this process is not going to happen. Okay, at this point, we have developed memory cells, B cells that are going to be activated immediately and are going to start making antibodies ipso facto. So we develop a huge amount of antibodies okay, that don't let the bacteria or virus even start producing symptoms in our body. And these are not going to be IgM. These are going to be other type of antibodies like IgG. We are going to mention later the differences be between antibodies, but know that, for example, when you have when someone has IgM antibodies, that means there is an acute infection. Someone uh, gets COVID and they have a test for antibodies. If they detect IgG antibodies, oh, that's great. You are protected. But if you have IgM, that means, oh, you're starting to get protected, but this is an acute infection. You just got infected in the past two weeks. Okay, that's the way we later interpret, okay, what is the meaning of the presence of antibodies. The same for hepatitis. If someone has IgM antibodies, that is an acute infection. If there are IgG, oh, this is either a chronic infection or that means the person is protected. Okay, that's the way we later and you're going to learn how to interpret different blood tests. So the cells of the specific response, adaptive response, okay, are the T cells and the B cells. Let's take a look at these B lymphocytes, the ones that make antibodies after becoming plasma cells to bind to specific antigens. Okay, every time there is a binding, okay, of a, an antibody to an antigen that will stimulate lots of reactions like, for example, the complement activation. Okay, we are going to see later what it means and what is the result of this activation. We are going to see that some of the complement proteins are going to destroy the cell. Okay, let's say this is a bacteria and there are antibodies here. The activation of the complement proteins are going to open a hole here and destroy the bacteria, but some other proteins are going to be released into the fluids. And those are the ones that are going to amplify the immune response. And these are the ones that I was mentioning before that if they are released in excess may produce anaphylaxis. Okay, these uh, B lymphocytes, 
okay, normally when they are exposed to the appropriate antigen, okay, will activate the B cell, let's say, they represent here a B cell, so you understand this part. Normally the B cells, when they are naive, they have never been activated. They have antibodies on their surface. These antibodies are called the, I, the, the B cell receptor. Okay, if they get in contact with an antigen, they become activated and they start dividing, dividing, dividing in a process called clonal expansion. This expansion is what makes, for example, when people have a swollen lymph nodes and tender lymph nodes, okay, that indicates that there is a process going on in the lymph nodes. Some of the B cells are gonna become memory cells, others are gonna become plasma cells to start making antibodies. Okay, so this cell, when becomes a plasma cell, looks like this. Lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum and no antibodies on the surface because it's secreting them. Okay, and we're gonna see the function of these antibodies later. You have the, these represented here, notice the B cell with the B cell receptors on top, little endoplasmic reticulum, activation by an antigen. Notice how the endoplasmic reticulum starts developing. Okay. And then we have the clonal expansion and how some of the cells become memory cells and some others become plasma cells with a huge endoplasmic reticulum and secreting lots of it, these antibodies. If we have a second infection, now the memory cells are the ones that are going to be activated and they start making or secreting antibodies immediately. And that's why the secondary immune response is huge compared with the primary. Okay, this is a comparison of the B and T cells. Okay, the differences are the place where they learn what to do, their school or processing place or maturation place, the type of immunity that they promote, humoral, antibody mediated or cell mediated in the case of the T. Subpopulations in the B cells, there are memory cells and plasma cells, while in the T cells, there are cytotoxic cells, helper cells and suppressor cells. And of course, memory too. Okay, these are the ones that we call CD8, CD4 T lymphocytes. Okay, these B cells have surface antibodies of the type IgM. Remember the one that is first secreted when there is an acute infection. Okay, surface antibodies. Receptors for antigens, yes, these ones. Yes, of course, in the T cells, there is a T cell receptor that is very similar to the antibodies, but it's not lifespan b cells live very short time the t cells can be with us for decades tissue distribution lots in the in the spleen not too many in blood like 15 percent t cells a lot in the blood and the lymph up to 85 percent of the blood lymphocytes And these are transformed into, or by antigens into plasma cells, and the T cells into activated lymphocytes. Okay, the B cells produce antibodies, while the T cells produce lymphokines. Okay, that, those are the main differences. Notice that, uh, uh, that there is more information below, but this belongs more to pathophysiology. Okay, I didn't delete this part here and I just simply uh, put it blurry so you get the information but you don't try to study this this is not necessary now so we've been talking about antibodies a lot but what are antibodies okay antibodies are proteins 
that have a very interesting shape. Okay, this is the typical representation of an antibody. Okay, that has two chains of proteins bound in the center. Huge proteins that are also bound to a smaller chain of protein. These chains in the center are called the heavy chain and the little ones are called the light chains. Notice that the antibody has like a, a shape that is like a Y. Okay, the region on top is called the variable region because this is the one that binds to antigens, to bacteria or viruses or toxins. The part below, the purple one here, we call it the constant region. This is the one that is normally bound to our cells, maybe bound to the B cell plasma membrane or later may be bound to macrophages. Okay, for example, here we have antigens and notice the interaction between the antibodies and the antigens forming an antigen antibody complex. See how all of the top parts of the Y are bound to the bacteria or the antigen? The constant region is the one that is gonna be recognized by macrophages. because the macrophages need to internalize all this complex. Okay, there's gonna be a macrophage here, macrophage here. Constant region is for our cells. Antibodies are known as immunoglobulins, okay? And there are different types, IgG, A, M, D, and E. Okay, if you take a blood sample, okay, most of the circulating ones are gonna be IgG because this represents our immunologic memory. We have all of these. Remember I told you before, in the secondary immune response, we have lots of IgG, meaning we are protected. In our blood, we have many, many of these IgG antibodies. Just in case something goes inside, we neutralize it immediately. Okay, IgA also, is important because this is the one that is normally in our secretions. Okay, if you make a test using saliva and you're looking for antibodies, you're looking for this IgA. It's also present in breast milk, sweat, and other secretions, mucus. It's, that's why this is called secretory antibody. Secretory IgA. It's present in our secretions. IgG is the most important in the blood. IgM is the B cell receptor and also the one that increases during acute infections. And IgD normally goes with IgM, okay, as part of the B cell receptor. We have here, okay, this representation. Notice also the different shapes. That is how IgA. It's like two antibodies together. This is the one that is in the saliva and breast milk. IgM, B cell receptor, produced during acute infections. And it's a, look at the shape. It, it is important because this is gonna bind as many antigens as possible. And this is huge. This is tiny. Okay, this huge size and this tiny size is what explains why, for example, IgG may cross the placenta and IgM does not cross the placenta. It's huge, it can't. Okay, so when we find antibodies, okay, in a newborn, they might be the ones that the mother it uh, transferred to them okay and when babies are breastfed what they are receiving is iga that will protect their gi tract from any kind of infection okay so these are the ones that the mother gives the baby through the placenta and these are the ones that they get with breast milk 
there you have the most important things. Okay, remember IgG increases in chronic infections, secondary response or after immunization, protection, IgA secretions. IgE is a special type that normally is responsible for allergic reactions and immediate hypersensitivity anaphylaxis. Okay, this is intended to fight parasites. IgM acute infections, primary infections, antigen receptor for the B cells. And IgD, no one is very sure what it does. But it's also present there in the B cell receptor. But we don't know what else it does. And the antibody functions. Okay, the most important function of the antibody is neutralize. Okay, remember the viruses, and let's take the example of the COVID. Remember the COVID needs to bind to the ACE receptor. Okay, there has to be an interaction for the virus to enter the cells. Well, if there are antibodies there, the interaction won't occur. So the virus will be destroyed and it's not going to infect any cell. There you have an example of a neutralization, okay, preventing infection, colonization, not only viruses, toxins as well. When we get the injection, the vaccine against the tetanus, okay, we develop antibodies against the toxin. So the toxin doesn't damage our bodies. Another function is opsonization. Okay, this is simply the recognition of the constant region of the antibodies by macrophages, okay, for phagocytosis. Opsonization simply means surrounded by antibodies, so, it, so we make easier the phagocytosis. And also, another function is the activation of the complement. Okay, every time there is an antibody bound to, a, to an antigen, it will activate the complement. And the complement proteins are going to open a hole in a bacteria, for example, and that will lead to the lysis or the destruction of the bacteria. Bacteria have a cell wall and they have a very high tonicity compared to our fluids. So if you open a hole here, since this solution inside the bacteria is hypertonic, compared to our tissues, water will enter and that will make the bacteria explode. So the complement system, very complicated, okay? But we are not gonna study it in detail now. Um, there are different ways. This is a series of proteins exactly as the coagulation cascade proteins. Okay, the proteins go from C1 to C9, and they can be activated by different ways. Okay, there is a classic pathway, and there is an alternative pathway. Okay, the classic pathway is the one that we mentioned before. Antibodies bound to the antigen. But they also can be activated by bacterial wall components, and that is called alternative. Okay, doesn't matter how you start, okay, the complement proteins are going to get fixated to the bacteria. And then you have a cascade, like the coagulation, that will end up with the opening of the cell wall by several proteins, okay, there are from C1 to C9, protein C9 to uh, C5 to C9 are going to be placed forming a pole that will make the bacteria explode and some others are going to be released and those are the ones that will attract other inflammatory cells and may produce anaphylaxis. The proteins that we release are the ones that create a chemotactic stimulus 
or inflammatory cells will facilitate opsonization, exactly as the antibodies, and will lead to release of histamine by the mast cells producing anaphylaxis in some cases. And notice here these proteins, C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, how they form this perfect structure that is called the MAC, membrane attack complex, that leads to the destruction of the cells by osmolysis. This is not to study, okay, do not study. We simply need to know the actions of the complement. Okay, this is representing here the classic pathway, anti and antibody complex, or the alternate or alternative pathway, bacterial components. Doesn't matter where you start, C1, C2, C3. It's a cascade that will end up with the activation of other, other, other proteins until a pore is formed. Okay, and then we have the release of other substances. Okay, that will have these uh, other actions. Okay, chemo attraction. Okay, amplifying the immune response. Now the T cells, uh, the T cells are the ones that can be activated only if someone else presents them with the antigen. Okay, they are not like the B cells that may be activated by a bacteria or by an antigen directly. They depend on the action of what we call antigen presenting cells. The T cells are normally in the lymph nodes or circulating. Okay, and these are the ones that, for example, when the dendritic cells find something on the skin or on the mucous membranes, are going to travel in the lymphatic vessels to present the antigen to the T cell. Okay, the T cell then is going to take a decision depending on this antigen. Is this extracellular? Well, I'm going to activate B cells so they make antibodies. Or is this intracellular? Well, I'm going to activate cytotoxic cells or CD8. So they travel here to destroy the cells that are infected by a virus. Notice that if the pathogen is extracellular, the B cells are going to become plasma cells and make antibodies that will go there to neutralize the extracellular pathogens. But if the antigen is intracellular, you, you can't send antibodies because antibodies are proteins and proteins can't enter inside a cell to, to find the antigen. You need to send a cell and the cell is going to directly destroy the other cell. That's why that is called cell-mediated immunity, cell-mediated immunity, and this is called antibody-mediated immunity. And there you have the interactions, okay, between a T cell and, a, and an antigen-presenting cell. Okay, antigen-presenting cells, well, in fact, any, any cell of the body can present antigens except the red blood cells, but we have some that are professional ones. like the dendritic cells, like the macrophages. Okay, the T cells have different subpopulations. For example, the helper T cell, also known as CD4. Okay, these are the managers of the immune response. These are the ones that stimulate B cells to become plasma cells, to make antibodies. And then we have the regulatory cells. Okay, regulatory cells, uh, were previously known as suppressor T cells. Okay, they form like a break. Okay, and if there is any problem with the regulatory cells, 
people may develop autoimmune reactions, exaggerated responses. Okay, and that is what explains certain diseases okay, that occur in our bodies. So in the next part, we have the regulation of the immune system, okay, that shows the important role of the T cell, T helper cell. Okay, in the center, you have the T cell. Notice that you have an area in the body where an antigen has been processed by the antigen presenting cells. Okay, the antigen presenting cell may be a dendritic cell presents the antigen to the T cell. We are gonna be talking about the MHC molecule. What is the importance of that? When the T cell is activated, it's gonna produce some lymphokines that is gonna lead to several actions. It's gonna activate B cells to produce antibodies of different types, and it's gonna activate other T cells like cytotoxic cells, CD8, and suppressor T cells. And the immune response depends on a proper balance between all these factors. Okay, what are these antigen presenting cells? Well, we have some professional anti and presenting cells that are macrophages and dendritic cells. Their role is to show the T cells what's going on so that T cell knows what to do and can properly coordinate the immune response. Okay, every cell in the body may present antigens except red blood cells. But these professional ones Okay, have special characteristics okay, that permit the free communication with the T cell. Okay, here we have, for example, <clears throat> sorry, a dendritic cell that travels to a lymph node. You have it after phagocytosing an antigen, traveling to a lymph node and presenting the antigen to the T cell. There is a green molecule there. This green molecule is something that we call MHC, major histocompatibility complex. After this presentation, the T cell becomes activated and it will activate other cells like for example, CD8. And the CD8 travels in another link vessel to the circulation and then enters in the tissues to attack cells that are infected by a virus, for example. Now the interaction between the antigen presenting cells and the T cells is, uh, is uh, performed using this major histocompatibility complex Okay, these were known previously as human leukocyte antigen. Something that we inherit from mom and dad. And it's a very important for our immune system to properly work. There are two types of MHC that are important for the immune response. One is called the MHC class one and the other is the class two MHC. Notice that the MHC class one is produced by every cell in the body except red blood cells. And the MHC class two is produced by the professional ones, dendritic cells, macrophages, also B cells. Now, there is something that is important to know how the interaction occurs, what are the molecules used? For example, the communication between antigen presenting cells and helper T cells is done 
using the MHC class two. So this green molecule that I mentioned before is the MHC class two. And this, this is a dendritic cell, but could be a macrophage. Now, once we send the CD8 cells, remember this is a CD4, the manager. Once we activate the CD8, the cytotoxic, okay, the one that's gonna go to fight there, this cell, the CD8, is gonna recognize what cell is infected because they are presenting the antigen, but in the MHC class one molecule. And that way the CD8 cell cytotoxic cells recognize what cell needs to be destroyed. So let's go back here. Cytotoxic cell CD8 can only be activated if the cell presents the antigens to them in MHC class one. T helper cells, CD4, activated only if the cell is presenting an antigen in the class two MHC. There is a mnemonic for that. Okay, you multiply the CD8 or CD4, okay, and you always have to obtain eight. Okay, so if you have a CD8 and you wanna get an A at the end, you have to multiply by one. So MHC1 interacts with CD8. If you have a CD4 and you wanna get an eight, you have to multiply by two. So interaction between CD4, okay, and antigen presenting cells is using the MHC class two. And there's another mnemonic here cytotoxic T cells because eight has T for toxic, if that works. In the case of CD4 are helper because cells ask for help, for help. Maybe that works too. Now, what happens? Let's say this is a cell. This is the MHC one. MHC1 is infected by a virus. It's showing the viral protein here. Normally the CD8 will go there and kill the cell after recognizing that this cell is infected. What if the viral infection makes, this is the virus here, makes something messes up with the nucleus so this cell doesn't express the MHC class one? How are we gonna recognize that this cell is infected? Okay, we have a plan B. For that case, we have the natural killer cell. Natural killer cells are innate immunity cells that they are like the police. If you have a, a, if you have a license plate in your car, if you have a driver's license, you don't have any problem, but if you don't have a tag or you don't have a driver's license, you are gonna go arrested. Natural killer cells are looking for the MHC class one. If you have it, you are okay. If you don't have it, you are gonna be killed. If you have a foreign one, you are gonna be killed as well. The MHC1 molecule inhibits the natural killer cell. If the MHC1 is not present, the natural killer cell is gonna get activated and it's gonna kill that cell. So if we have a viral infection and the cell is presenting the antigen on MHC1, the CD8 is gonna take care, specific cellular response. If the cell is not presenting MHC1, the natural killer cell is the one that takes care. Plan A or plan B. And this is all that we have. I, I knew I, was go I wasn't gonna have time for this, so that's why I recorded the video. Okay, I put it there on, on the chat so you can watch it. It's, it's like the same thing that we've been talking about, everything together.
okay? Because there are some other things that we have to maybe in another lecture talk about. Okay, there you have more resources. If you wanna see some videos about it. These are different uh, things from your book, okay, that I put there. Just if you wanna take a look at other diagrams and you have some questions at the end so you can practice.